Welcome to the first in a series of IA webinars looking at foreign affairs and international relations from a classical liberal perspective. I'm Sai Kamal. I'm a professor of politics and international relations at St Mary's University in Twickenham. I'm also the academic and research director at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Now in this series we plan to cover contemporary issues in foreign affairs as well as looking at international relations from a historical, theoretical and ideological perspective. Now, given that we're recording this podcast on the week of Joe Biden's inauguration as the 46th President of the United States, today we'll be turning our attention to the change of leadership in the United States and what this could mean for US foreign policy and the rest of the world. Now, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Steve Davies, who is the head of education at the IA. He's an academic historian and recently co-authored a, a paper, Chinese Puzzle, a Classical Liberal Approach to Post-Pandemic Relations with China. And he's also written and spoken on many issues, including classical liberal uh, uh, foreign policy. So, Steve, before we look forward, let's look back at US foreign policy, probably since World War I, um, US foreign policy, you know, Wilson's liberal institutionalism, then, of course, the balance of power of the Cold War years. Um, and then also Donald Trump, where did he fit into that history? I suppose we'll start off. And then secondly, how would classical liberals look back at Trump's four years? Mm -hmm. Well, um, if we think about the history of uh, US foreign policy since World War I uh, and the abandonment of the historic policy of uh, isolation and minding their own business on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, I think you can see a kind of constant tension within American foreign policy between two things. One is a sort of ideological approach to foreign policy, which sees it as being about the realization of particular uh, ideological goals. In Wilson's case, it was the idea of a certain kind of world order, one that embodied principles of national self-determination, uh, liberal politics broadly defined. For Ronald Reagan and subsequently the neoconservatives, it was about spreading a particular set of economic, political, social values around the world in one way or another. So that kind of ideological approach is one half of the story. The other half of the story, though, is the uh, resort to realpolitik and the government of foreign policy very much by the kind of very hard-headed realist principles that great powers have followed uh, throughout history, really. And you can see that with people like George F. Kennan and the other people who formulated American foreign policy in the immediate aftermath of World War II, George Marshall and uh, Dean Acheson and others, uh, quintessentially, of course, in the person of Henry Kissinger. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, in more, the more recent past, that realist approach to US foreign policy has actually uh, not taken such a prominent rhetorical position. I think we've had quite a bit under George W. Bush of a return to the more Wilsonian uh, ideological posture. Uh, Donald Trump, perhaps in many ways, more of a reversion to a realist position in foreign policy. And it will be interesting, therefore, to see what happens uh, going forward. But when you look at Trump, in some ways he was different as well, wasn't he? I mean, he was a, even though he had this American first uh, uh, viewpoint or policy, he didn't, for example, intervene as much in, uh, overseas. I mean, in fact, funny enough, he did uh, people often say, you know, he actually convinced, for example, Israel to sign peace deals with the UAE or the other way around and vice versa. And apart from Yemen, perhaps, he hasn't really intervened as much as some of his predecessors. So some classical liberals may well take heart from that. Indeed. I mean, I think uh, in terms of his foreign policy, both before and after he became president, uh, this was the one aspect of his politics, I think, that classical liberals felt quite sympathetic towards because of strong classical liberal opposition to um, what you might call Wilsonian grandiosity or the kind of extremely ambitious foreign policy that the neoconservatives had been pushing under George W. Bush. And so, uh, as you rightly say, uh, Trump actually avoided intervention. We didn't get the kind of rather messianic project of remaking the world in a particular kind of American image that you'd had under George W. Bush. Uh, in the Middle East, he did push back and reverse Barack Obama's um, agreement with Iran and put severe pressure on the Iranian regime. But when push came to shove, he refused to follow the advice from what we hear of quite a lot of his military and national security leaders uh, and take preemptive military action against Iran, for which, in my personal view, much thanks. 
Uh, and I think his policy has been, um, in that sense, much less interventionist and therefore uh, much better from a classical liberal point of view. And as I say, in some ways, he's a reversion to a more uh, realist approach to foreign policy. There's a strong element of American unilateralism, the idea that the United States should seek to act really in a way as a conventional great power uh, and not act as much as it has done since World War II through the medium of uh, multilateral institutions such as NATO and the WTO and the like. There's a kind of reversion back to a much more traditional model of great power politics in which each great power acts on its own really on the basis of a calculus of its own interests as opposed to trying to construct a kind of, uh, as you say, Wilsonian international order made up of institutions and working through them. Uh, and so many people are very alarmed by this, but actually in many ways it's a more realistic approach to foreign policy because it reflects the actual emergent reality of a multipolar world in which the United States is not the overwhelmingly dominant power that can basically set up and run a set of institutions and expect them to operate in the way it wants them to. Now the interesting question is will Biden continue down this more cautious and reserved path if you will in some ways uh, less ambitious path perhaps, uh, that Trump has started. So it's interesting you say that because one of the things that people are expecting and lots of commentators is given Trump's, what at times, hostility to some of the international and inter intergovernmental organisations, such as the WTO and the World Health Organisation, probably criticism that many people actually share that the WHO failed in its one job to uh, early on to deal uh, with, 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 the, with the pandemic. Um, the, the signals coming out of the Biden team seem to be that there's going to be a re-engagement with these, uh, these multilateral institutions, a sort of reversion to liberal institutionalism. You no know, COP, for example, um, people expect him to unblock some of the, uh, the problems of the WTO with the appellate judges, uh, perhaps even uh, uh, um, you know, agreeing to an appointment of the pe person that people want to be the next director general. Um, we've seen the early signs there. We're expecting that. Do, do, is it just a reversion to almost Obama, Democrat, liberal institutionalism? Well, we'll have to wait and see, I think, um, because one of the things to emphasise about the foreign policy of any any country, actually, but particularly a great power like the United States, is the degree to which it's actually almost independent of the personality and uh, wishes of the person who's nominally in charge, the president in this case. Uh, foreign policy is very much an area of public policy that's run by experts. Uh, ultimately, the decisions are made by the man or woman at the top, but they operate within a much more constrained sphere, I think, of options than is the case with uh, other areas of public policy. And it's also the case in the case of the United States and the incoming presidency, Joe Biden, that a lot of what he wants to do will be constrained by the material realities and political realities that he faces and that any American president, uh, a re-elected Donald Trump or somebody other than Biden would face. And I think that there will certainly be a move back towards trying to unblock the WTO, get certain international institutions of that kind of working again. The problem or the challenge for him is that we are not in the world that we were in uh, immediately after the fall of the Berlin Wall, where the United States had what appeared to be an unchallengeable supremacy in world affairs with no rival on the horizon. We're now clearly living in a world where the center of economic and in many ways the center of political gravity in the world system is shifting to Asia. Uh, and you've got a whole lot of rising Asian powers. People talk about China, obviously, but you should not forget Japan, still one of the world's largest economies. Uh, there's also India, there's rising powers in the Middle East, um, as well as Israel. There's also Iran and there's Saudi Arabia, which is uh, trying to sort itself out at the moment. So you're dealing with a much more multipolar world. Now, it's one thing to say that you want to govern that world through multilateral institutions. The challenge for Joe Biden is that the historical Wilsonian kind of multilateral institutions that were created after World War II are ones where the United States had a kind of predominant position. Although they were nominally multilateral, what many countries felt, uh, sometimes quite 
crossly, others in other ways with more equanimity, was that they were actually basically an instrument in which the United States set the agenda. Uh, originally, they'd been designed by Roosevelt and the other leaders as being an instrument through which the Allied powers who had won the Second World War would continue to collaborate together uh, after World War II to order world affairs. But of course, that didn't last because of the very rapid breakdown of relations between the Soviet Union and the, the other powers, the Western powers. Uh, but so thereafter, you had a kind of policy, a set of institutions with the United States in the driving seat. Now, I just don't think that is possible. And if there is an attempt by the Biden administration to move back into Wilsonian multilateralism on that basis, then I can foresee a lot of trouble because there's going to be very significant pushback to that uh, from the Chinese, but also from lots of other people, maybe even from the Europeans, from the Germans, for example, who are very resistant to uh, pressure from the United States right now to cool their trade relationships with China. Uh, and these things could actually work out quite badly for them if they go down that route. And the other part of the context, of course, is that Joe Biden has an enormous amount of domestic stuff on his plate in one way or another. And he might well decide, or his administration might well decide, that they will try to refurbish some of those multinational institutions. But in the meantime, they really want to, you know, uh, focus much more on domestic than on foreign policy in terms of spending political capital and trying to get things done. It's interesting what you said about the US preponderance in the uh, some of these international uh, uh, governmental organizations or international organizations for short, because uh, quite often liberal institutionists used to argue great example of liberal institutionism, countries coming together to cooperate um, and share ideas, uh, whereas actually realists also like these intergovernmental organizations because it, it reinforced Americans dominance, if you like, um, yeah. in, in the world. Um, it's interesting, we talked about this sort of shift in the sort of balance, not the balance of power, but um, in terms of dominance and, and, and powers. And clearly we mentioned China. Clearly China is the elephant in the room and is on the agenda. Um, we saw, partic uh, particularly in the light of China's behaviour, or the Chinese Communist Party's behaviour in the light of the pandemic and its lack of transparency early on, that brought forward lots of other issues. You know, concerns about China's near, near foreign policy, our concerns about intellectual property issues. Um, now, we wrote, you and I wrote a, a, this paper, Chinese Puzzle, mm. where we say it's not about a Cold War, it's about a China first strategy, access to resource markets and technology. But how do you think, you know, will Biden continue Trump's sort of almost at one time hostile, sometimes trying to make a deal with the Chinese? Um, and also, given that the EU have just signed a, or about to sign a, an investment agreement with China, that's obviously angered the Americans. How do you think Biden will deal with China uh, in his early years? That's a very difficult thing to say. I mean, the problem is that he himself, as a politician, doesn't have enough of a kind of track record of prominent positions. Uh, on this. He has always, as a politician, been focused more on the domestic. I think a key question, therefore, is who he appoints to senior positions, uh, not just the you know top roles like Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, but in some ways, more importantly, uh, the roles downstream uh, or down the tree from those two top posts. Uh, if the neoconservatives, who were very prominent uh, under uh, George W. Bush, and to some extent even under Bill Clinton, come back into the fold and once again uh, have a major role at both the Pentagon and uh, the uh, State Department, then I think we are going to see a lot of pushback against China, quite an aggressive attempt to reassert America's position in the world and also perhaps to, you know, put the screws on uh, the Germans essentially and the EU in, with regard to things like trade relations with China. Um, the, as I say, I think that would not work out well at all. I think that would be an extremely bad move from the um, point of view of the United States, actually, quite apart from that of the rest of the world. And it's a question of, therefore, of who he appoints. If he doesn't appoint those kind of people, he starts to appoint other figures uh, who are maybe not part of such a clearly defined intellectual coterie with such a clearly defined agenda, uh, then I suspect we'll see a more pragmatic approach uh, where the idea is to a, so pull up the Chinese where they're seriously misbehaving or causing problems for their neighbours, but also to try and strike deals with them, which is a pragmatic approach that I think the Chinese leadership would probably be open to, uh, given that, as we argued in our paper, 
it's not clear that at all, to put it mildly, that China's foreign policy is driven by an ideological agenda. It's much more classic uh, great power rail politique. And of course, there are other things going on in the world. Uh, there are other actors besides the United States and China. We're not moving back into the kind of bipolar world that we saw between about 1948 and 1989 uh, with the United States and the Soviet Union. There are lots of other actors coming up on the, on the stage at this point. Uh, we're beginning to move into a world which, if we get it right, will be much more like the world that followed the Congress of Vienna, a multipolar world with a fairly uh, interesting but ultimately stable dance of relations between eight or nine uh, major centres of power in the world, uh, certainly uh, more, than, more than just two. Uh, and if he's in smart, I think that's the way he'll go. We will, however, need to wait and see just what course relations take uh, with China and indeed with, with regard to other parts of the world, such as the Middle East, for instance, or Africa uh, or other parts of Asia. Let's talk about other parts of the world. I mean, clearly, China is one of those uh, big areas. The other area is transatlantic relations, um, both uh, whether Britain was a member of the EU and now that Britain's left the EU, we'll talk about that separ separately. But clearly, there will be people in Brussels and EU capitals uh, look looking optimistically towards a relationship with uh, Biden and perhaps re reinvigorating a TTIP, though I know I speak to people on both sides at the Atlantic and say, well, what's going to be different this time, given that TTIP, the EU-US tra EU trade relationship, ran into problems first time round um, under, under Obama when there was goodwill on both sides. How do you see that transatlantic relationship, particularly in terms of one of the drivers of uh, transatlantic relations? Is, is, is in, in a way a sort of motivation to continue setting the rules at the international level, you know, whether it be finance, whether it be trade, and not allowing China or others to intervene and set those rules. Right. Well, I think there's several issues there. I think you're quite right about that. I think that the what you might call the foggy bottom elite in American foreign policy and the regulatory states in the United States and the leadership of the EU are both very, very keen, as you say, to continue being the rule setters for things like uh, economic regulation, rules governing international trade, intellectual property, all that kind of thing. Uh, uh, personally, I think that uh, th that's a fool's errand. I think that quite apart from that, I think it's undesirable anyway that there should be a single system of international rules of that kind, regardless of who creates it. Uh, I think that they're basically in completely the wrong places. They think that going forward in the world as it is now, particularly the world as it is clearly going to be in the next few years after the pandemic has ended, they'll be able to do that kind of thing and uh, recover that kind of predominant position that they had when gap rounds were basically uh, ultimately determined by the alliance between the EU and the United States, plus a few other countries chipping in. The reason, of course, is there's been a fundamental shift, I think, of economic gravity over the last 10 to 15 years, which has really been consolidated and accelerated by the pandemic. And that is from the lands around the North Atlantic uh, back to the historic heartland of the world economy, which is East and South Asia. Uh, in a way, the, we're now in a position to say that the last 200 years, from 1800 to about the late 20th century, was a bit of an aberration, really, because historically, that part of the world has always been where the economic centre of gravity is. And I think it's clearly gone back there. If you look at the effects of the COVID pandemic, major hits to GDP uh, in most of the world, East Asia, very mild, uh, in, if, if anything, I mean, there's still con growth continuing in several of the countries in that part of the world. Uh, they've handled the whole pandemic much better. Uh, the impact in all sorts of ways, both medical and economics, has been far slighter. And I think that emphasises the degree to which that is where the action is and where the effective governance is. And so if the EU and the United States do have a kind of project or attempt at recapturing their position as the dominant rule setters, I think they will find that that's just not going to happen because not only will China and India ignore it, but also, more importantly, their trading partners will ignore it. So countries in Africa, uh, the Middle East, large parts of Latin America even, are not going to uh, follow rules set by the EU and the United States, if that means they miss out on uh, 
highly valuable to them investment deals with uh, India or China or for that matter Saudi Arabia so it's not or, or Japan it's just not going to happen so I think that's that's an area where there may be a bit of a learning process going on on the other hand I think that one thing that is true is that there will be um, a much more equable and stable relationship between the United States than the EU than was the case under Trump. I mean, I think that uh, quite apart from the personal you know, factors involved, uh, the degree of unilateralism that Trump displayed and uh, his views of Russia, for example, and other things of that sort uh, were so at odds with those of many people in Europe uh, that I think, uh, you know, there was an obviously a real problem working there. I'm not so sure that the TTIP is going to actually uh, be any more successful because I think the main problem there um, is not so much that the people at the top on the either side of the Atlantic don't want it, it's that they face pretty serious grassroots opposition. Um, the growth of populism in Europe, uh, lots of equivalents in the United States, uh, these are politicians who don't like this kind of investment deal and I think that therefore it will be very very difficult for many European governments in particular uh, to agree any realistic version of a TTIP. On the other hand I do expect that we will probably see quite a lot more cooperation uh, between the EU and uh, the United States with regard to relations with Russia. Uh, that's an area where uh, I do think that the United States is going to uh, weigh in much more on the EU side in the kind of uh, standoff that's going on over Ukraine and other issues in Eastern Europe. Yeah, I was going to come on to Russia, actually. Um, but before I do that, I should also another a point on TTIP is that one of the things when you talk to politicians on both sides of the Atlantic, they say the problem is they've got their sort of civil society organizations and trade unions accusing each other of having weaker standards. So the Americans will say, well, let's not sign up to European environmental and uh, food standards they're, and labor standards, they're weaker than ours. And the American, uh, the British, the European trade unions and the European uh, Greens will say the EU, sorry, the US has lower standards on environmental issues and, and, and labor rights as well. So, and, and, and you know, and never, never the twain, uh, you know. So, um, but let's talk, let's turn to Russia um, because People have tended to ignore Russia. You know, thing is, it's not the Cold War, as you say, since 1989. But they're still powerful. They still can cause trouble. Um, you know, when they went into Crimea, clearly, um, they did, the fact that there wasn't a strong, uh, tough, uh, hawkish president in the US gave um, Putin the signal that he could he could he could go in. There hasn't been much done since then, really, apart from a few you know resolutions passed and the odd condemnation in various parliaments. Um, how do um, it does Russia still need containing you think about some of its foreign agents and other countries how do you think they, uh, they, they will look at Russia well uh, unfortunately okay to pull back a bit and sort of say, yeah. say something in preamble before I address the main point of your question I think that Western policy towards Russia and particularly American policy towards Russia in the last couple of decades has been unbelievably wrong-headed uh, from any kind of foreign policy view realist foreign policy view the regime in Russia is not an attractive one, to put it mildly. Uh, you know, Vladimir Putin is not the kind of ruler or leader that anyone committed to liberal or democratic principles is going to like. But the fact is, uh, he is there where he is, and he's a very popular leader from what we can tell in Russia itself. Moreover, you do have to ask the question why he's so popular, and one of the reasons why is he achieve such a hegemonic or dominant position within Russia? And there are various answers to that question, but one of the answers undoubtedly is that since the end of the Cold War, the United States has been, and Western Europe as well, has been pursuing a policy which you can figuratively describe as poking the Russian bear in the eye with a blunt stick. Uh, doing things like expanding NATO up to its borders when they said they weren't going to do this, uh, moving missiles right up into Russian, you know, the edge of Russia's airspace, again, something they'd said originally they wouldn't do, and then also fermenting and stirring up, because that is what happened, uh, opposition in what the Russians regard as their near abroad, Ukraine, regardless of what you think about the you know, status of the, the government that was overthrown in the Maidanek upheaval, which was seriously corrupt and improper one, but despite that, a democratically elected one. Basically, if you... Uh, you know, a provoke uh, a power in that way, you can't expect them to take it lying down. Uh, and there's a classic case here of uh, willing a particular end without being to face up 
being prepared to face up to what the means were. And so what I think has happened is that you've actually had the result of strengthening Putin's position in Russia, because he's come to be seen as a kind of standard bearer of an affronted Russian nationalism. Uh, you've also uh, basically opened up the path to uh, much closer relations between um, Russia and other Eurasian powers like China uh, and so on, and to Iraq, uh, Turkey as well. And so this has actually been, as I say, a major foreign policy own goal in, in my regard. Now, what should, what, what do I think is going to happen? How are um, the West going to approach Russia now? Well, I, I fear that we're going to see uh, a continuation of what was done before, more kind of aggressive actions towards them. Now, I think the, the more appropriate way is not to, again, not to, um, apologize for or cozy up to an unpleasant regime but simply to treat them if you like in a way that recognizes genuine great power concerns and also to recognize i think uh, where there might actually be some common interest because looking at it from the realist point of view think you know what would henry kessinger say if you like uh, what you want to do is to detach uh, Russia from other countries that you might think of as being rivals in the quadrille or dance of international relations uh, and see where there are common interests. Now, one of those common interests, I think, is actually to uh, protect regimes in some parts of the world against what you might call fourth generation problems, non-state insurgents. I think the big foreign policy challenge for uh, stable governments of all kinds, whether it's the EU, the United States, uh, China or Russia, is that there's a huge arc of instability beginning in Central Asia and stretching right through large parts of the Middle East and then right across sub the northern parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, the Sahelian region, where you have extremely fragile states and a lot of violence, most of which is committed not by governments, but by non-state actors. And in that large area, the thing you want to do really as your main foreign policy goal, I would say, is simply to maintain a minimum level of political order. Uh, it's the non-state actors, which is not just terrorists, it's things like clans, armed gangs, organized crime, all these kind of forces. Uh, you want to actually cooperate with all the other you know, major powers to try and stabilize the situation there and keep a lid on these, these people. Uh, what the Russians have been doing in some cases is doing that, but also in some cases they, they've been stirring it up. And I think that therefore this is what you want to put a stop to. And that probably involves cutting a deal with them. But I fear that that's not what's going to happen. It is worth saying, by the way, that you know, the old famous saying about Russia, Russia is never as strong as it looks. Russia is never as weak as it looks. Uh, you know, the Russian state faces all sorts of really serious structural problems, a very aging population, declining population, an economy that really um, is A, kleptocratic and B, still massively dependent on a number of primary products which are subject to highly fluctuating prices in global markets like gold, uh, various kinds of metal, uh, metals and of course oil. Uh, and so therefore it's not as strong as uh, it might have been many people suppose it is so you shouldn't see it as a really serious threat on the other hand dangerous country to underestimate because you know it has it also has an extremely effective intelligence system uh, and uh, nowadays a pretty effective military so it's not a lightweight either so those that's the kind of strange uh, contrast you always have to remember with russia and it's interesting that you say about that sort of instability it kind of almost reminds me of uh what Hedley Ball wrote to what he wrote, I think, in the Call of Society, you know, the sort of founder of the English School of International Relations, that we may have all these other ideas of international justice and peace, but order is incredibly important. And how do you maintain that international order? Yes, absolutely. And the, the thing is that historically, most people who think of international order think of threats to international order as coming from predatory states or anti-systemic states uh, who break the rules and uh, try to conquer their neighbours or disrupt the international system. Uh, the Third Reich under Hitler being a classic example, arguably the Soviet Union, uh, certainly for some parts of its history being another one. Uh, but what I think we're faced with at the moment is a much older problem, which is the existence of, in the current terminology, failed states or fragile states, parts of the world where you're reverting to something almost like a Hobbesian state of nature. 
Uh, and this is the situation you've got in large parts of the region I described, uh, or states which appear to be at the moment in charge, but which are extremely fragile, where if somebody was assassinated or a coup took place, you can see the whole process falling to pieces uh, pretty rapidly. And that's a much more serious threat in many ways in the world in which we live today, because it has massive spillover effects, because uh, a collapse of political order in a large part of the world like that uh, tends to give sanctuary and space for all kinds of seriously unsavory people. As I say, terrorists, organized criminal gangs of one kind or another. Uh, and I think the threat that these kind of forces pose to stable political order in the better governed parts of the world should not be underestimated. Uh, and as I said a moment ago, the, the focus is often on terrorism, but I actually think that organized crime and organized crime networks are a much bigger problem and one that uh, many governments, uh, I think, don't take quite seriously. They don't realise the extent to which they're confronted by international networks that can uh, get up to all kinds of mayhem if they're given the chance. And one of the things that does give them opportunities is the presence of large parts of the world like Libya at the moment, for example, where there's no effective governing power at all. Uh, and that's a safe sanctuary for them, but also it enables them to use it as a route uh, for uh, all kinds of activities that you don't want to see happening. Yes, and there's lots of uh, uh, academic study on a, a number of these sort of the international crime networks, trans, call, transnational uh, international crime networks, uh, also aided by obviously better communications technology and transportation technology. Now, I think probably to wrap, wrap up, as it were, we should bring it closer to home. You know, we are both in the United Kingdom. Um, people quite often talk about the UK-US special relationship. The UK talks about it all the time. The US talks about it when it suits them, if you like. But also you have to... If you look at it, um, one, of the, one of the truisms of international politics, and I suppose domestic politics as well, is that you, you deal with the world the way it is. Now, we know very well that um, Biden and Americans historically have preferred the UK to be part of the EU. Go back to Dean Asherson, for example. He was very keen for the UK to be part of the EU. Kissinger used to say, when you call the Euro Europe, who, you know, who are you going to call? Let's have you know, a, a yeah. single, the single number. Now, Britain has left the EU. Um, uh, Biden was quite clear that he wasn't going to look at a UK-US deal until the UK had signed a deal with the EU. We have signed some sort of, sort of deal. How do you see uh, uh, future relations? There, were, I know talking to uh, friends of mine who, uh, in fact, a, a former staffer of mine who went to work for Biden, said there was some uh, concern about uh, Boris Johnson, especially when he insulted um, Obama after Obama intervened in the Brexit debate. Um, how, but but Biden has to deal with with Boris Johnson. You know, Biden is the president. Boris is the prime minister of the United Kingdom. How do you see that relationship? I think it'll work the way um, it always has done, actually, um, in a very professional way. I think actually, uh, it's certainly the case that the historically the um, US has strongly favoured UK membership of the EU for a number of reasons. Uh, but they accept, as everyone I think really has to, apart from a few irreconcilable certain. That Britain has left the EU uh, and that both the EU and Britain are now moving on. Now what that means is that they will, uh, on the one hand, it does not mean, I think, that uh, Britain is going to be ignored because it's no longer in the EU or that it will be slighted or uh, you know, treated in a bad way. I don't think that's going to happen. Britain is still a large and important economy. It's a close ally of the United States. It's an ally also with uh, its own freestanding military capacity, even if in much reduced state these days. And therefore, the United States will, I think, just straightforwardly try to you know, carry on the kind of relationship that it's had for a very long time with the UK, uh, and probably to arrange some kind of uh, trade deal, even though obviously, as always, the devil will be in the details of doing that. So I don't think that Britain is going to be slighted. On the other hand, though, to qualify that, uh, I think, uh, the kind of people who think that, oh, because we speak the same language and there's a historic connection between the two countries, we're going to have a kind of special access to the ear of the president or to the councils of the American government. I mean, I think that's a fond delusion, which I don't think people in the British government actually believe. I mean, uh, we are an important country, but we're not 
anywhere near in the same league as the major powers of the world at the moment. We know we're uh, we're down in the uh, the Championship these days. I think it's fair to say not the Premier League of, of world powers. Uh, so there are limits to just how far we can expect the Americans to uh, you know cut deals with us. Uh, they're not going to do it if it involves making a deal at the expense of uh, the relations they have with the EU, for example. Uh, that, that's just not going to happen. But I don't think there's going to be any particular uh, ructions or, or major challenges, really. I expect it to be uh, what you want international relations to be, which is really rather boring uh, and governed by uh, professional rules rather than any clash of personalities. So. Um, Typically, you know, if you're head of government, um, you don't you don't worry about whether you like or get on personally with the head of a another country that you have to deal with. Your job is to, you know, work with them and uh, each accept that each view is representing your country and your government's you know interests and uh, proceed on that basis and not allow your personal feelings to colour it. Obviously, they do to some degree, uh, but that's why you have civil servants and other people there partly to. Uh, you know, try and iron over anything like that. And I'm quite sure that's what will happen. Yeah, and that is the reality rather than realism of the world, isn't it? You deal you deal with who you have to deal with. Um, so let's... Yeah, precisely. Uh, yeah, so, so, so to, really, to really wrap up now, let's, uh, why don't we do a bit of crystal ball gazing? I know it's it's very easy and people might look back in four years' time and say, you got that wrong. Um, or we might, they might say, or we might say, we got that right. But, you know, looking forward, given the early, given what we know of Biden, given what we know of some of the Democrats, who might take positions in, in his administration, uh, given that we know about the domestic policies, given that we know how different what he's, uh, some of his pronouncements, where do you think classical liberals may be able to take comfort or hope to take comfort in the next four years from US foreign policy? And where do you think we might end up being, say, horrified or just in disagreement? I think we will probably be able to take comfort in the fact that so far it looks as though the kind of very aggressive agenda that was in the ascendancy under George W. Bush is not going to be uh, revisited. I think the I think the foreign policy elite of the United States, if you like, is rather chastened, quite honestly, as indeed they should be, considering the kind of enormously costly uh, errors they clearly made under. Uh, George W. and the cost it's brought in terms of you know life and money and uh, suffering for many many people in many parts of the world. So I think they're going to be much more chastened, and uh, I don't think we're going to see, or at least I really hope not, but I don't think so. We're not going to see a reversion back to that kind of world transforming agenda that you saw uh, under the Bush administration. And I think classical liberals will be you know very sort of like thankful for that. Um, what we would might well, what could happen, and which I think classical liberals will probably have four years think was a, an error, or at least many of them think was an error, uh, is an attempt, as I said earlier, to uh, recreate a kind of supranational system of global rules which works at the behest and ultimately in the interests of the Western powers, because I think an attempt to do that uh, is not going to get anywhere. Uh, and so I think if that is followed, and I think it may well be, then there's going to be a rather painful learning experience, I think, for Western powers over the next four years. But I'm, I'm more hopeful than I would have been, you know, had uh, certainly a lot more hopeful than I would have been had Hillary Clinton won the election against Donald Trump. I mean, I think that um, much as I dislike Donald Trump, uh, I think she would also have been a very, a very bad holder of the office because I'm I'm pretty sure the United States would have gotten involved in a war at some point during her administration. Uh, whereas I think the chances are that for various reasons, the uh, Biden administration is going to be very concerned to avoid that kind of foreign policy entanglement. Well, Dr. Stephen Davis, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'd also like to thank viewers and listeners for joining us. I hope you found it as fascinating as I did. Uh, for more details of all our online content, please visit our website, ia.org.uk. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, IA London, or listen to our podcasts on Podbean. And to help us keep providing free content during these tough times, if you know of someone who might consider making a contribution, no matter how modest, please do point them to our website, ia.org.uk slash donate hyphen now, where they can donate online. Once again, Steve, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you to our viewers and listeners. We hope that you'll be able to join us again soon.